Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening today to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. My guest today is not only a culinary school graduate, but is a chef professor at a prestigious Canadian college. He not only went on to get his master's degree in education, but he also has accumulated numerous certifications and industry awards. And all of that is just part of his culinary school story. So now let's meet today's guest, Chef Sam Glass. Sam, welcome to the show and thank you for coming on and sharing your culinary school story with the listeners. Great to be here. Always happy to share my culinary journey. And it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I think the last time we saw each other was probably at the Johnson & Wales campus in Florida, or it might have been in Denver. But I, I do remember being at the campus in Florida and walking the grounds and, and seeing all the trees and fruits and vegetables growing. And I thought that was really cool. So yeah. it, it might have been Denver. It might have been Florida. A cafe event, probably. De- definitely a cafe event, yes. Yeah, that's our edible landscape down there. It's great. You know, the coconuts, the mangoes, you know, all the tropical fruits that most people don't get the chance to see. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to start right out by asking, uh, how did you first get into cooking? Okay. Um, a long, 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 long time ago, I had the opportunity to work at the Canadian National Exhibition, which is basically the equivalent of a state fair. Um, there was a food stand there called Shopsies. And in and around Toronto, Shopsies was famous for their delicatessen and their corned beef. In fact, the owner was a second or third cousin. So my father connected me with the, uh, my cousin, and they gave me a summer job. My first summer job was basically taking corned beef, putting it in big, big boiling pots of water with garlic and onion and pickling spices, letting it simmer as, until it was done. And then we would put it on the old automatic Burkle meat slicers. And that's where I learned to cut corned beef, both by machine and by hand. I, I worked at the, the Canadian National Exhibition, I believe, eight summers. So that was back in seventy. Four. So might have been six summers, whatever. But that's where I started. Um, and then Shopsies had a delicatessen in downtown Toronto. And over the Christmas holidays, I would spend a couple of weeks working there while they did takeout for Christmas and New Year's. It was working overnight, you know, and that kind of sparked my interest. Um, it then went to I worked in two or three other restaurants here in Toronto, and and it kind of piqued my interest. Um, I never had planned to go to culinary school. I never really had an interest in being a chef, but I kind of grew into it. Um, At the same time, I was going to university. I was a political science culinary school. I never really had an interest in being a chef, but it, it I kind of grew into it. Um, At the same time, I was going to university. I was a political science major. Um, You know, I had in the back of my mind, maybe I was going to be a lawyer. But over my three years of university, I acquired two years of university credits. I was not a great student. (laughs) At the same time, I was working part time in restaurants. And there were a couple of people there that were Cornell graduates. So they weren't chefs, but they had gone to the Cornell Hotel School. And we started talking and I said, you know, I, I really like this industry. What should I do? And they said, well, you know, look at Michigan State, look at Cornell for hotel management. And I said, I don't want to be that guy. I'd rather be cooking. So they said, well, go do your research. 
So my research basically took me to, yeah, we had a couple of community colleges here in Ontario, um, but I looked south of the border. And I was very, very fortunate enough that in 1980, my family had the resources of two years really set the foundation of who I am and where I am now. So I'm sure that campus has changed a lot since then, but still you were living on the dorms, I'm imagining. Yes. And so what, what was it like when you first got to campus, when you're arriving, you know, excited, here you go, your career's starting. What was it like? Take a walk us through that first day. The first day was really an emotional roller coaster. Um, I remember meeting my roommate. Um, he, he was getting ready to graduate. So I think he had maybe six more weeks because, you know, they, they do the progressive learning year. There's an entry date every three weeks or whatever. Um, I remember him, of all things, playing Little Feet <laughs> and Lowell George singing Dixie Chicken. And that was my introduction to Southern Rock. So it was a, you know, a guy from Canada being introduced to that was really weird. I was 22 at the time. And it was really, you know, my first time away from home. Um, I remember uh, going to my first meal there and it was fish and I'm not a big fish eater. And that night I was homesick, I was a little teary eyed, a little nauseous. And I said to myself, what am I doing here? I overcame that. Um, and it's funny, I think the next day or two days later, at lunch, they were, so, they were serving, of all things, Philadelphia pepper pot soup with tripe. Wow. Never had tripe in my life, never understood it. But what was really interesting um, is that when the soup arrived in the, in the cup, there was a twist tie in it from a bag of bread. And I turned to my classmates and I said, I'm going to cooking school and this is what's going on. <laughs> so in, in, in the beginning, it was a little bit of homesick, a little bit of um, trying to figure it out. Because again, back then you had to have experience to enter school. You had to show that you were dedicated to your career. And, you know, I, for all intents and purposes, I had been a prep cook, ordering on a short order cook. I never had that, dare I say, classical background, whereas others might have had that experience. So I was really, really new to the game. Um, during my two years there, if I'm not mistaken, I was one of maybe 10 Canadian students at the school. So again, you know, um, I considered myself an international student, but I don't consider, you know, being Canadian and American. Right. It's so close to the border there. Meeting new friends, meeting um, new chefs, learning new things. It, it really, it began there for me. Um, there, there was a lot of, um, I'm going to say, eye-opening exper eye experiences. I mean, I remember... Um, I don't know if you remember him, Chef Wayne Almquist. He would teach the first the first three weeks. And we started about talking about how do we season the pan. And the way I had seen it done, you know, they put lemon juice in it, they put oil in it, they put herbs in it, and they seasoned it. And it was like, no, that's not what we meant. So it's like open mouth and insert foot. What you were thinking was right was absolutely wrong. So there were some embarrassing moments thinking that I actually knew it but then slowly I began to realize I don't know it and I need to know it and I want to know it so you know that was the beginning of it um, living in an environment that 24 7 is food centric made it much more interesting too again where I teach now um, not everybody lives in residence or on campus, but if you're living, living in residence, you're, you're surrounded by food. It's a very food-centric environment. Again, a community college in general is not going to be food-centric. A culinary school would be. So that was part of the, I guess, the growing experience, the learning experience, um, living in that food-centric environment where, you know, 
there were clubs for different things that you, you know, they had, if, if, if memory serves me right, they had the Saucier Club. And it's like, I'm going to be a member of the Saucier Club and I'm going to learn all about sauces. Wow. <laughs> so there were, there were always things on the go there for us at the college. I mean, at, at the CIA. And it was a uh, relatively remote campus up there, Hyde Park, Culinary Institute of America. What did you guys do for when your time off? What did you do on the weekends? What, I mean, where could you go? What did you do? So if, if driving, you know, from, I'm going to say from Hyde Park to New York City, if we wanted to drive in, I think it was, you know, an hour and a half, possibly two hour drive. Um, one of my roommates, his grandparents lived in New York. So if we wanted to, you know, go to New York and spend the weekend in New York, we could stay with them. Oh, good. We were across the river from New Paltz. So if we wanted to, you know, experience uh, part of the Woodstock culture back in the day, we could do that. Um, the Hudson Valley is incredible. Um, if we wanted to, you know, we could even drive to the Finger Lakes and go to the wineries. There was always something to do. So we, we found ways to keep busy. But, you know, there was homework, too. We, we had assignments to do. We had readings to do. Um, our day would generally start at, I'm going to say seven in the morning. You know, we would have breakfast prepared by, by the students. Then we would go to class. And if we were in a cooking class, we cooked for the rest of the school. If we were in a theory class, we were in class and then we would go have lunch. So if you were in the morning classes, it was breakfast and lunch. If you were in the afternoon classes, um, they would still serve breakfast style food in the afternoon for the afternoon pantry classes, and then they would have dinner. So there was always something going on. There was always something to do. It was, it was a busy time. And e even, you know, if you just wanted some quiet time, you could just, you know, find a place to sit and overlook the Hudson river and watch the steamships go up and down the Hudson river. So it, it was, a fun time there was always something to do it seems like today's student a lot of them a good percentage of them are working did was there that the case when you were there did a lot of the students work was there opportunities for that there were whether within the school or in and around Hyde Park and Poughkeepsie there there were some part-time working opportunities um I think the student back then is a little bit different from the student now with the financial resources. Again, I don't know what the prices are of, of a private of, of a private culinary school, but I think you know now for those who choose to attend one, it's expensive and, and possibly out of reach at some time. So they definitely would have to consider working part time. Good. Okay, classic question: What was your best class? What was your worst class, and why? I, I honestly enjoyed every class um i would say the class that i struggled with the most was probably baking and advanced pastry um you know i believe that cooking is an art and baking is a science and as a chef i like to create i don't like to be restricted by formulas and ratios so that was you know part of it um I really, I really, really didn't struggle with most of the classes. I, I thoroughly enjoyed them. There were some great faculty members who taught us really well, made it fun to be there, pushed us. Um, you know, there was one chef, Chef Jim Haywood. Um, he passed away recently. Um, I had him for introductory garde manger. And when I was in the garde manger class, it was December. Chef Haywood would open the windows up in December to make our kitchen as cold as possible. To say, you're in the cold kitchen. This is what a garde manger kitchen should be like. Um, back then, um, and the school has changed since I was there, they had a what we called the coffee shop class. So it was, you know, short order cooking, true American diner slash coffee shop. And I actually got 100% in coffee shop. I don't know if I should brag about it, but um, it, was, it was a fun class. Like every, every class was fun. Every class you learned something. Um, every chef 
shared his or her experiences in unique ways that made the learning uh, interesting. Some of the chefs were really, really good at letting you try new things. Um, and, and I think, you know, yes, has now being on the other side as a culinary educator, I think, you know, we, we have to restrict our students sometimes, but when they get to an advanced level, let them play. Um, I remember there was one chef, his name was Walter Schreier. He was one of the pastry chefs. And he, in his class one day, we had to make a raspberry Bavarian tort. And I remember, you know, the last step of, in a Bavarian, correct me if I'm wrong, is, you know, the folding in of the whipped cream, just in, into the mousse and whatever. So I said to him, chef, I have a question. What would happen if we went 50% whipped cream, 50% sour cream? What would happen? He says, well, why don't you try it? So with his, I'm going to say blessings and permission, I did 50% whipped cream, 50% sour cream. And I want to say the raspberry sour cream Bavarian tort is absolutely incredible. You know, so the, the chefs would encourage you to take that basic understanding and you could explore just a little bit. Um, now being an educator, I want my students to, to command the basics, but if they want to explore a little, I'll give them a little bit of leeway that, yeah, you can explore, but you still have to meet what I need you to do. Yeah, I worked, I had a chance to work with Walter at uh, Florida Culinary Institute. We worked there together for a while. He, he's t teaching his pastry. I mean, I, you know, he was, Chef Schreier was famous. I believe there was a picture of him on the cover of Life magazine flipping a cheesecake. <laughs> Claim to fame. You have to look that one up, okay? Um, I, I, I want to say probably the, I'm not going to say, probably the toughest lesson I ever had, the most interesting lesson that I ever learned was my last week of the first year. So we were getting ready to go on externship. We were in a production kitchen and the production kitchens would produce lunch or dinner for, for those students who were not in, in a cooking lab. So we had to make cream of tomato soup. So my chef back then, his name was Chef Willie Stinson. He came into the kitchen, he put a rondeau on the stove, he poured two buckets of stock into it, tasted it, and he says, yeah, this stock is pretty weak. So he then got a couple of boiling hens or fowls, took a little bit of mirepoix, threw it into the, to the rondeau with the stock. My classmates and I then proceeded to use that stock to make cream of tomato soup. Comes time to present um, to Chef Stinson. We present our cream of tomato soup. And he looks with us, and I'm going to use a little prof profane language here. He goes, shit. That soup tastes like you used fish stock. So what had happened, Chef Stinson had poured two buckets of fish stock into the rondo and threw in a chicken. Now, if you saw two fowls, hens, or chickens in a pot, you would assume it is chicken stock. Yep. Well, it wasn't. So we then, you know, had to redo it. We found the chicken stock. We did it right. So this was in 1981. In 1992, I was at the American Culinary Federation National Convention in Washington, D.C. And I see Chef Stinson and I go, Chef, I don't know if you remember me, but I remember you. And I proceed to tell him the story. And I look at him and I go, Chef, did you do that on purpose? And with the biggest smile on his face, he says, what do you think? So the lesson was learned in 81. Fast forward, you know, to 2005, whatever. I'm teaching at another school and I tell my students the story. And, you know, the moral of the story is you always boil up a stock before you use it to make sure it's the right stock and that it's not sour. So my students are doing a the practical. They had to do a chicken valentine filled with rice pilaf. 
One of the students proceeded to make rice pilaf using fish stock and then put it into a chicken valentine. The student failed the exam. And they had been told, always boil up your stocks, never assume. So if I could say that was probably the greatest lesson I ever learned in cooking school, I still use it now with my students. So again, it, it's interesting. I, I think as an educator and as a chef, I'm the product of all my previous chefs, lapse it into my world and, and, and take the best of everything. That's great. Good stories. <laughs> and it come back all around. You see it again, you know, next generation's doing the same mistake. Everything <laughs> old is new again. You mentioned uh, American Culinary Federation. Could you speak to certification a little bit? I know you're certified. I know you're a, um, an evaluator and you've gone through, did some competitions. Could you speak to that to the listeners and explain maybe why that is something that you would encourage them to get involved with? Sure. So I'm a certified executive chef. I'm a certified culinary educator. Um, I'm also a fellow of the American Academy of Chefs, but that's an honor society. But going back to certification, to me, certification, oh, before I even forget, I also sit as a member of the certification commission for the ACF now. So myself and about another dozen chefs, we together get together twice a year to do to review all the current certifications and whatever is going on with that um i think certification is very very important it shows that you've attained a level of competency it's a goal that can be achievable it separates you you know it's 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 a professional credential um there are arguments that um there's no value in it. I, I see there's value in it that you have a professional accreditation. You know, there's also the argument that, you know, some chefs have cooking smarts over book smarts and other chefs have book smarts over cooking smarts. To get your certification, you, you have to have both. Um, when you certify at any level, there is a theoretical exam that you must do. There is a practical exam that you must challenge. And once you're certified, you can't rest on your laurels. Um, e even at my level, I have to recertify every five years. I have to renew my sanitation certification every five years. I have to demonstrate to the ACF that attending a conference or a convention, doing an online course, um, because I'm a certification evaluator every time, that I evaluate a practical exam, I get credit for that as well. So to me, certification is really, really important. There is great value in it. I'm a big proponent of it. Um, I know that everyone who has been certified has worked long and hard to get that certification. And again, I, I don't think any chef should sit on his or her laurels. Um, again, if, if, if I'm gonna transit right now to the world of education, um, we all have to be lifelong learners. And I don't know everything. I don't pretend to know everything. I am forever learning. And, and part of that learning is the certification process. And now there's a Canadian Culinary Association as well, I believe. Is that something you would participate in? Yes. I'm sure there's the World Chefs and there's other ones out there. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the American Culinary Federation. Um, I'm a member of the Canadian Culinary Federation, also known as the Culinary Federation up here. I've been a member of ACF and the Culinary Federation here 25, 30 years. Um, our Canadian organization you know, is about a tenth of the size of the ACF. But then again, Canada is about a tenth of the size population-wise of the United States. Um, the World Chef Society is... I, I want to say it's the governing body or it's an association of all the associations. Um, in regard to the world chef, um, I am under the world chef's umbrella, a level B judge. So if there's a, a sanctioned world chef's competition, I am a level B judge. And again, um, I achieved that by competing, by teaching, by by attending seminars, by meeting all the criteria. So I, I'm involved 
<laughs> in many culinary organizations that way. And then this is all part of networking, professional development. Um, they have meetings. They have conventions. Yes. I mean, the, what's interesting, the, the college that I teach at, Centennial College, we have a, a junior chapter of the, of the Canadian Culinary Federation. And we do a lot of in-house competitions for our Culinary Federation students. We will have corporate sponsors come in um, and do a competition. Um, here in Ontario, there's the Ontario Veal Association. So we had a competition where we had six or eight student teams compete to make the best veal sandwich. We've had uh, one, a knife company, F. Dick, come in and they've sponsored a knife skills competition. We had to get the rulers out to measure the brunoise and the fine dice and, and, and the julienne. <laughs> so all, all these organizations are really good. The networking is incredible. Um, two years ago, the Canadian Culinary Federation had our national convention in Niagara Falls, Ontario. And I, I attended, I was actually judging one of the competitions, but four of my students attended with me. And while we were there, I introduced them to Stafford de Cambra, president of the ACF, who was there. And Stafford gave them each a president's pin. Now, if you're a young culinarian and the president of a national organization gives you one of his pins, it means a lot. Pretty big deal. It is. Our, our Canadian president at the time, Don Gurkovitz, was there too. And he took my four students under his wings. Um, you know, just he was so happy to see it. You know, at, at the end of the day, ha as a culinary educator, it's all about the students. We, we want our students to succeed, to be the next generation. We want to introduce them to industry. And, and one of the things that we often talk about with our students, our industry it's no more than two degrees of separation. It's not six degrees, it's two. Um, when I meet my students for the first time, I do a PowerPoint presentation. And one of the slides I show is me on the set of MasterChef Canada with the three judges. Immediately, immediately the students go, you competed? They go, no. Did you judge? No. But... I know all three judges professionally. And you have to realize that because we know each other, if you do something inappropriate to me, you're not going to get that recommendation. If you show to me that you're worthy of going to the next level, I'm going to introduce you to those chefs. I'm going to have you work with them. Um, here in Toronto, we used to have an event called um, Gold Medal Plates. And the event was a competition in every city in Canada. They would take the 10 top chefs. Each chef would have to produce 600 portions of an appetizer. They would have to be served to the paying guests who were paying approximately $500 a ticket to be there. And I was fortunate enough that for every event, I took 30 of my students and my students or school students, they were assisting these chefs and it was real life. You know, when we are teaching in cooking school, you know, you're, you've got four hours to make two dishes. When you're at a competition and you have to crank out 600 plates in one hour, you put your head and, and, and you do it. Um, what was really, I'm going to say, satisfying for me, a couple of the chefs, my students were putting on the last touch on the plate before the chef passed it off. And to be standing right beside the chef, putting the last touch on the plate, that means all the world to me. And I think the students realize, holy cow, this is for real now. Like, this is what I do, right? So, and again, that, that, goes back to the whole concept of networking. Um, I think, again, as a culinary educator, it's important that we take our students out into the real world and network with them. You know, there were, again, going back to cooking school when I was there, there were opportunity to meet 
some of the important chefs uh, uh, of that time as well. So networking is huge to me. It's really a small community. I mean, everybody knows everybody in some way. And so it's, yes, and they're, and they're the future. So it's great to introduce them and, and get them on board. Uh, what is one common myth about the profession or culinary school or the industry or the kitchen that you want to debunk? Something maybe you hear a lot, maybe from the students, maybe from someone in industry that they believe and we have to say, no, no, that's not quite it. You know, I, I think there's been a, a shift in kitchen culture. Um, you know, I, I joke with my students, um, when I was in cooking school and early in my career, you know, I graduated from the school of cook until you drop, you know, the kitchen's become a kind of gentler place. It's, you know, I, I joke with my students, it's always going to be blood, sweat, and tears. One of you will cut yourself. It gets very hot in the kitchen. And when you peel onions, you're going to cry. Um, students go now to cooking school based on what they saw on television. You know, the Food Network has definitely created an interest in, in, in the culinary world, but what you see on television and what happens in a real kitchen don't always connect. Um, I, I've seen too many people say, I'm going to be, you know, the next great chef on TV. Yet, you don't have those basic skills. You don't have that knowledge, that understanding of what it's like. You, you haven't experienced it. You know, I remember early in my career, I was doing an event and it was a banquet. It was a fundraiser. And one of the things that we were serving was cream of asparagus soup that was finished with a liaison. And of course, the liaison curdled. 40 years ago, we didn't have immersion blenders that we could kind of save it. So I, you know, again, I remember myself and the three sous chefs holding four corners of the world's largest piece of cheesecloth and trying to, to, to pass this soup through the cheesecloth to, to remove the, the scrambled eggs. Um, that wouldn't happen right now. Um, you know, if I'm going to editorialize right now, um, I think think sometimes we've lost touch with what cooking is all about. Um, you can teach a 12-year-old how to in insert a thermometer into a pork loin, put it into a combi oven, touch all the dials and set it to cook, and it'll work. But what happens if the technology fails you? I mean, we're, we're a little bit maybe too technology dependent. Um, one of the things that, you know, I show my students, I, I ask them, I say, so if, if we put the probe in and there's a power failure, how do you know if it's done? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We put a thermometer in. Well, what happens if you, you don't have a thermometer? What do you do? I don't know. The way that I was taught, and I think, chef, you were taught this too, take a meat skewer, put it in, put it to your lip. Cold is rare, hot is well done, warm is medium. You know, so we, we, we've kind of lost that. Um, again, I, 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 technology is forever evolving. You know, the whole notion of immersion circulators and sous vide is wonderful. It's great. But that being said, personally, I will choose a braise and a stew over just about anything because you have to be in control of it. You know, um, again, the, the whole notion of an 18 hour sous vide duck leg. To make confit no let's let's go the old way maybe i'm showing my age but we do have to acknowledge that that technology is there it's just a question of i think we need to teach them to walk before they run so now with some perspective thinking back was culinary school worth it for you would you do it all again i mean thinking of the money the time was it was it good would you do have change anything i would do it all over again a hundred percent um even you know now that i know what i know I probably would have done even better, but it, it gave me that foundation. Um, I, I'm not going to devalue anything. You know, if, if somebody chooses a pure apprenticeship route and never goes into school, by all means, do it. Um, the nature of the game, though, if you want to be that chef manager, that chef owner, you're going to have to learn the management skills. 
the management theory. You're going to have to learn a lot of things. School can provide that with you. Not being in school can also provide it. But I, I think you need that educational background. But you also have to realize, I think, that sometimes school can be a little bit over-nurturing. Um, you know, you're in a very safe environment if you're in a teaching kitchen and you know, there's 24 students and you've got all the room in the world to do two dishes. It's very different, you know, if you're in a small, tight kitchen and you're the prep cook or you're, you're, you're on the line. You're going to learn that way, too. But you might, you might not understand the theory of it. Um, you know why it works, but you don't understand why it works. Um, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of school, not because I teach in one, but I, I think, you know, th there's still value in it. And again, you and I both see there's always these online debates, articles, school yes, school no. I'm on the school yes side. Mm -hmm. So tell us where you're working now. You're an instructor and when, how long you've been there and what kind of programs you have. And tell us a little bit about what you do and the students that you have. Where do they go when they graduate? Okay. So I teach at Centennial College's School of Hospitality, Tourism, and Culinary Arts in Toronto. Um, our culinary and baking programs are less than 10 years old. Prior to then, we were just a hospitality school. And within our hospitality program, we had a student-run restaurant where um, our students were given the opportunity, you know, to spend seven classes as front of the house and seven classes as back of the house, learning the culinary basics. As a hospitality student, you need to be able to communicate in a professional language. Um, you know, if, if, if you're a front of the house manager and you need to help out in the back of the kitchen and the chef says to you, okay, I need you to cut me 10 pounds of mirepoix. The only question you should say, is it mirepoix for chicken stock or brown stock or fish stock? But then the chef looks at you and says, okay, so you understand what mirepoix is. So we were originally a hospitality school. Um, we then expanded into baking and culinary. Um, we have a relatively brand new building with three culinary labs, two bake labs, a grab and go, uh, student run restaurant. Um, and what's really unique, um, our building on the eighth floor of our building, the, the first floor is all of our culinary space floors two through seven are the student residents. And the eighth floor is an event center. So we have the ability to do events, I think, sit down up to 200, maybe 250 people. So we have a banquet kitchen. So our students, you know, get the opportunity to actually work in a banquet kitchen as part of their education. And there aren't too many schools that do that. Um, we offer a one-year culinary skills program, a two-year culinary management program, a one-year baking skills, a two-year baking management. Um, we have some postgraduate classes, one in food media, one in, one in food tourism. Um, our hospitality school has several different programs as well. Um, one of the things that my college is trying to do um, is the indigenization of our curriculum and our school. Um, you know, Canada has a very, very strong First Nations heritage that we are trying to, they talk about truth and reconciliation. And again, if, if we're looking to south of the border, um, it's, it's the equivalent of acknowledging that slavery was wrong and you need to do the right thing. So we're indigenizing our curriculum. Um, so what we're trying to do is meet the outcomes of cooking, but by using indigenous ingredients. And, you know, so if, if I were to talk about one Canadian indigenous ingredient, it's wild rice. So that's, you know, a truly, yes, I know it grows in Wisconsin and Minnesota, but we call it a Canadian thing. But so we're trying to integrate that. So if, if you integrate that, um, if you were to take trout or salmon and cedar plank it, that's, you know, part of it. I, I am by, by no means an expert on indigenization, but 
you know, we're trying to acknowledge our First Nations heritage. Great idea. And integrate that into our curriculum. We have also at the school, um, two years ago, we planted a vegetable garden in front of our building. So kind of similar to Florida, but a little bit different. And what's really nice with the vegetable garden is um, our students will say, excuse me, chef, I need to go to the garden. I want to cut some garnish for my plate presentation. And, and that to me is a win. Um, we, we, we use the garden as a teaching tool. I remember two years ago, we were discussing Bernays sauce. And most of my students have never seen or heard of tarragon. So I said, okay, we're going outside. It was a two-minute walk. We had tarragon growing. And I said, rub it between your fingers, smell it, touch it, taste it. That, that to me is real learning when you're, when you're able to do that. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been able to, with the garden, um, pickle our peppers. Uh, one of the chefs to, last year, um, we were teaching our students how to make Caesar salad. He took the students out. They cut up kale. And within 15 minutes, they had a romaine and kale Caesar. Same learning outcome, but introduction to a, a different uh, item. And did, I, and did I see online that you have bees as well, hives? We have, we have an apiary. That was put in two years ago. We haven't integrated it as much as we'd like to into the curriculum. We definitely use the honey within the school. But we have to be careful that... Um, you know, we want to make sure that nobody has a bee allergy. Um, right. But the honey is an interesting story. Um, what's really cool, if you want to talk about the circle of life, we, we put our apiary within 10 yards away. We have six crab apple trees. In the spring, the bees pollinate and feed off the crab apple trees. By the fall, the crab apple trees are picked. And for the past two years, we've made crab apple jam and crab apple jelly with the students. Um, you know, if, if you want to talk about zero carbon footprint, there it is. Local and sustainable, you know, practice what you teach. We've had the opportunity to do that. And I think that's really important. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate that, you know, our college supports these projects. And it's, it, it's really, you know, a, a great learning tool. Is there a website that the uh, listeners could go to to see pictures or find out about the school? Or? I mean, www.centennialcollege.ca. Okay. And then look for School of Hospitality, Tourism, and Culinary Arts. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes, too, so they could find it. Okay. The other unique thing we did, we built an outdoor oven for baking bread. Wow. So again, part of the indigenization process is, is, is that um, we also mill our own flour now. So we buy whole grains. We actually have a grain mill in one of our baking labs. Cool. Um, you know, and one of my colleagues last year, he basically ground whole wheat flour and then proceeded to make whole wheat pretzels all within four hours in one of his labs. So again, what we're trying to do as a school is, is show our students the whole process. You know, I'm hoping at some point we can get to whole animal butchery. We're not quite there yet, but at least our students can see how flour is milked. At least our students can see how vegetables grow and, and where they come from. At least our students can understand where honey comes from. And, uh, you know, the, the bees is also supporting the worldwide initiative of, of saving the bees i mean the honey is a byproduct it's more important that we save the bees um, but it becomes an educational tool because if you're teaching baking you need to know about honey yeah that's so cool what you guys are doing so we're, we're all over the board yeah that's really good let me ask you though what do you think is the future of culinary education um what i see is a, is a couple of things um i i think we need to be more aware of where our food comes from, more respectful of, of our food. Um, you know, we're very fortunate here in North America that we have an abundance of food. And sometimes we take it for granted. One of the things that I believe in, I think at some point, every chef should take down an animal just once in his or her career. Because, you know, you have to understand that you're taking a life. You can't take it for granted, you know. 
yes, I've cut the head off a fish, I've cut a lobster in half, but I've never taken down a, a warm-blooded animal. I think at some point we all should. Um, I think, you know, the words local, sustainable, field to fork, farm to fork, whatever, are, are going to become much more important. Um, the big word is sustainability as well. I mean, we have limited resources and we need to make sure that the resources are there for the next generation. It's almost like we have to take a holistic approach. There's, there's more to being a chef than just cooking. There's a big picture. Where does your food come from? Is it sustainable? Am I using everything that I can use? Um, James Beard Foundation has some incredible things online now when it comes to um, sustainability practices. Watching what Dan Barber does, I think, is very, very important. You know, um, th there has to be that awareness of what we're doing is important, and and but we have to realize it's more than just cooking. There has to be the respect for the land, the respect for the animal, the respect for the people. And, and again, the respect for the people now, that, that paradigm shift in, in, in the restaurant world. You know, if, if we go back to Escoffier, it was really, really bad. In, in, in a lot of ways, in a lot of kitchens right now, it's not all that much better. Um, I, I think we can do better from, you know, a respect for our employees, a respect for people. Like, let's need to be respectful and and you know we can use the term living wage um, there's all sorts of terminology we can use but it really boils down to respect um again my my generation it was a high to soft a high testosterone zone that's changing and it needs to change um you know is it okay to do the odd kitchen prank depends what the kitchen prank is you know, we've all sent somebody out to get a bucket of steam or to get the lobster gun or to get some finely chopped flour. That's all fun and jest. But once you go further than that, and if it's verbal abuse or physical abuse or mental abuse, that's a no-no. So it, it's changing. It, 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 it's it's got to still be a much more kind and gentle place. Um, I had chefs who yelled at me. <laughs> I, I can tell you the last time I yelled in the kitchen. I, I remember when it happened it was 19 and this is a good story too it was 1983 i was working at a place um, in toronto called the courtyard cafe it was in the windsor arms hotel and, and back in the day that was one of the best places you could work classic french cuisine sunday brunch i'm making omelets and you know in the 80s there was nothing called teflon we had the black steel pans that you had to season so my omelet pan began to stick I threw it across the kitchen and oh, I threw it across the kitchen. I screamed something. And the sous chef looked at me and says, until you effing know how to cook, don't you ever scream or throw a pot again like that. <laughs> 10 minutes later, the executive chef comes up. His omelet pan sticks. He throws it across the kitchen and yells. So I just looked at the sous chef and kind of chuckled. Um, I don't like to yell in the kitchen. It's, it's not worth it. Um, I tell my students, I talk loud to get my point across. There's a difference between talking loud. Um, you know, I will get upset if, if I see students fooling around in the kitchen. Um, my big thing is, you know, when you walk in the kitchen, your knife to be, needs to be pointing down. I mean, if I see a student walking and his knife is pointing up, my, my running joke with the students is, you see that knife? I will take it. I will cut your heart out and hand it to you, just like it happened in Indiana Jones. Don't tempt me. <laughs> you know, it's I, I don't see that as a threat. I'm just trying to explain to them that you please, you know, don't do that. It's sure. You know, I, I I've been in one kitchen fire. I only had four stitches in my career. I was accidentally stabbed in the elbow once. So I take kitchen safety seriously, and, and that to me is, you know, when you, when you see students fooling around or not being safe in the kitchen, they don't realize that in an instant something can go really, really bad quickly. Good. Uh, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a culinary school, contemplating going to it? If they asked you, they came to you, what, what would you say to them going into this industry? So, so one of the things that I say to all of my students, and 
I'm pretty sure I picked this up from Chef Fritz Sonnenschmidt a long, long time ago. I tell my students cooking is the application of heat, common sense, and passion. I can teach you how to apply the heat. I can assist you with your common sense. But if you don't have the passion, you're, you're in the wrong industry. Um, I still get excited if I get you know, a whole salmon to clean. I still get excited because, look, the eyes are clear. The gills are red. It smells like the ocean. I still get excited. The moment that you lose your passion, your excitement, you shouldn't be in the business. So you have to have that passion. Um, you have to realize that it's going to be a very, very long journey. I've been doing this a long, long time. Um, and it took me a long time to get where I am. So you have to be prepared to do it for the long haul. There will be good days. There will be bad days. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, you will remember the good days. You will remember the bad days. And those good days, it makes it all worthwhile. Um, one of the places where I worked, there was myself. There was the executive chef. I was a sous chef. There was another sous chef. And we had two teenagers on the line. So it was really the chef was at the pass. I did the fish station. The other sous chef did the meat station. And we had our two young kids doing the vegetables. We would do, you know, 250 covers a night. And it was like a symphony. And at the end of the night, you just said, wow, that was the quickest three hours. And you remember how things flow, right? And, and you go, that's really good. That was really, really fun. Um, you know, when, when you have a customer send back, you know, beers for the kitchen, some people still do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we all like praise. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have bad days when you burn things, where you cut yourself. Um, the good should always outweigh the bad. It's an incredible journey. And if you're young and, and starting on the profession, you never know where it's going to take you. Um, I've been really, really lucky. I've cooked in Canada, the United States, France, and Israel. Um, I've taught in Canada. I've taught for a couple of weeks in China. I've taught for a couple of weeks in India. Um, my other passion, I used to volunteer for the American Navy and go out on ships and train American Navy cooks. I only got to do that because I'm a chef. You know, I didn't do it because I'm Sam. I got to do it because I'm a chef. And it's an incredible journey. You, you make lifelong friendships. It, it's just so much fun. I mean, I've been very, very fortunate. I, you know, there, there are some who haven't had the fortunate journey, the luck that I've had, whatever. But I will also argue that I've worked really, really hard to get where I am. You know, it, it's not without sacrifice. Um, I was chef at a country club for four years. And my summers were six days a week, 16 hours a day. My children were very young then. I hardly got to see them most of the summer. That was a sacrifice. Do I regret it? Yes and no. But it got me to where I am now. So it, it's not, you know, if, if someone's starting out, by no means is it an easy road. It's going to take time. It's going to take dedication. It's going to take passion. It's going to take education. It's going to take networking. Uh, the one thing that I always caution my students about is stay away from the world of substance abuse in the kitchen. I've seen people hurt themselves because they were under the influence of something. You know, and again, if, if, if you look at our industry, that's one of the biggest demons that we need to avoid. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with the odd beer after service. I'm, I'm all for that. But during service, no way. So it, it's, it's a whole bunch of different things that, you know, you need to consider. Um, if you don't love it, don't do it. If you're not excited about it, don't do it. it it's one of those professions that... You have to use your brain and you have to use your body. You know, certain professions, there's no physicality to it. Our profession, there's a lot of physicality to it. You know, we, we've all been in very, 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 very hot kitchens where you just have to keep on staying hydrated. And, you know, I, I remember one of the places where I worked every morning, 16 liter pail of iced tea. And we would just, you know, make a big pot of iced tea. And we knew that there would always be a nice, cold, refreshing drink for us. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm.
freezing the towels, putting them around your neck. <laughs> oh, yeah. All sorts of tricks of the trade. <laughs> Is there a l- question I should have asked? Is there anything that I should have asked but didn't? I don't think so. Um, the one thing I'll say, and I, and I think you can relate to this too, for those considering to becoming a culinary educator, for most culinary educators, it's our second career. I don't think anybody goes to cooking school to become a culinary educator. We go to school to become cooks and chefs first, and then we become educators. Um, And, you know, the the beauty of being an educator is you get to shape the future. Um, One of the things that I often tell my students or ask my students, I say, name me five Nobel Peace Prize winners. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that. Name me five people who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. They can't. Name me five teachers that have influenced you. They can. And I always say, you know what? I want to make that top five list at some point in your life, right? So again, we we get to shape the future, which is really, really satisfying. And again, as an educator, you know, I, I draw on my educational background. As a chef, I draw on everyone that I've worked with or who's taught me. And you, you, you only want to take the best practices. You, 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 you know what's bad, but you never want to integrate. You, you just want to integrate the best practices. Um, you know, another thing that, I'm, that I, I think anyone entering a culinary school needs to be aware of, culinary school will teach you skills and knowledge. But sometimes what culinary schools don't teach you is behavior. And by behavior, you know, my, one of my mantras is on time is late, 15 minutes early is on time. So, you know, and, and I say that to my students when, when they go, when they graduate and they show up late on day one of their job, there's 25 other school graduates waiting for that job. So you, you need to teach the, the behavior. The behavior is punctuality. Um, maybe I'm being a little bit patriarchal here, but yes, chef, no chef is still very important. I'm not Sam. I'm chef glass to you. We're, we're not on a first name basis, you know, outside of work. It, 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 it's a different thing. Um, the respect for the uniform, you know, is, is important. And, and again, I know there's been a, a shift. I'm of the generation who still likes that crisp white jacket, that long white apron, the tall hat. Uh, is it okay to wear a colored uniform and a baseball cap? That's what your employer wants by all means. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I, I, I just believe in, in, in the tradition. I acknowledge that there has been, been a shift. Again, that's just evolution. Cool. Um, as we come to the end of our chat today, before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice or guidance that you want to leave with the listeners? Something that you want to share? Going back to what I said earlier, um, I think it's a great profession should you choose to become a chef. Um, You have to really, really want it. You can't do a half-assed backward jobs. As I tell all my students, cooking is the application of heat, common sense, and passion. If you don't have that passion, you will not succeed. You have the most incredible opportunities available to you should you choose to take advantage of them. Um, if I was a young culinarian starting out, again, I would go to cooking school. I would spend a year to 18 months at my first job. I would spend another year to 18 months at my second job just to get experience. Um, not knowing what the future holds with world travel, work outside of your country. Get that international experience under your belt. Again, I was very, very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do a six-month stage in France. And one of the restaurants where I worked, the urban legend was that the chef's father-in-law had apprenticed under a scoffier. Oh. So, you know, you're talking about six degrees of separation. You know, I was immersed in that world of classic French cuisine. It doesn't mean it was the best type of cuisine in the world, but, you know, I, I lived in that. Um, so definitely try to work outside of your country of birth to get that international experience. Um, I think it's important, you know, you, you can't always have that tunnel vision perspective of, you know, whether you live in Canada, whether you live in the United States, you, you, you need to get out there, 
You need to see the world. And, and again, I go back to my students and I say, when you're done school, if you have the resources to travel, travel a little bit. You know, somebody once said the introduction to any culture is food. So, you know, if, if you can travel, like I had the opportunity to go to China three times. And I'll be honest, um, once you've had, I hope I'm being polit politically correct here. Once you've had Chinese food in China, you'll never want to have Chinese food here in North America because you're really comparing it. Is there, are there some good Chinese restaurants here in North America? A hundred percent. But the true authentic Chinese cuisine, once you've experienced it, you, you've been spoiled. Um, going back to my experience in France, um, I worked at a two-star Michelin. While I was there, I visited, I, sorry, I ate in seven three stars, wow. including Bocuse. So, you know, th that's another way of learning. You know, like, again, advice for a young culinary student, try different types of food. And, and that's another thing, you know, I'm going to say, one of the things I find with, with culinary students, sometimes they won't eat it because they don't like it. And, you know, I will never tell somebody to go against their religious beliefs because, you know, you, you can't eat pork, you can't eat beef, whatever. But if a student refuses broccoli, I say to the student, um, can you show me where in your religion broccoli is forbidden? <laughs> you need to try it. Just even, even a little bit of a bite, right? There are things that I, I don't like oysters. I've had them twice in my life. I, I know how to open an oyster. I know what it tastes like, but will I order it? No. You know, so you, you need to have, as a culinary student, you need to try new things to get out of that rut to experiment because at some point you're going to have to cook it and you need to know what it tastes like. So that's, you know, another, if, if, if we go back to the advice for culinary students, try, try, try. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode, and I want to first thank you, Chef Sam Glass, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. Really appreciate your time and the insight you gave to the listeners and your honesty. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? Thanks. For sure. Take care. Bye now. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207 835 1275. That's area code 207 835 1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network. Media Network.